Hi, my name is Julie Huber, and I'm a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And in part two of my talk, I want to tell you about subsea floor life at Axial Seamount. I wrapped up part one by telling you about the amazing reactions created between water and rock that create energy sources to support microbial life in our ocean. And I also told you that there were many types of water rock reactions on our planet that can sustain life. What I want to do in this part, as well as part three, is really focus in on one of these types of systems and tell you a story about how the science of understanding subsea floor life has evolved over the last 20 years of my career. So I'm going to take you to a mid-ocean ridge, which is where oceanic plates are spreading apart, new ocean crust is being formed, and underwater volcanoes occur. So at these uh, underwater volcanoes, as I discussed in part three, or part one, sorry, I collect these crustal fluids that are leaking out of the seafloor to try to infer what's happening beneath the seafloor. Now these crustal fluids are a mix of hydrothermal vent fluid and seawater that are usually below about 100 or 120 degrees Celsius. These uh, fluids are the largest source of new carbon into the vent ecosystem, meaning the main source of primary production into the deep ocean in these systems. And they contain a lot of biomass. They contain about five to 10 times more microbial cells than you have in the surrounding ocean. And one of the really neat things is if I collect this fluid up here, which is about 20 degrees or 30 degrees Celsius, let's say, I can actually culture microbes that grow at much higher temperatures, up to 90 degrees Celsius. They don't like oxygen, and they're eating things like sulfur and hydrogen. And that implies that they live in a habitat that's warmer, that is without oxygen, beneath the seafloor. So by collecting these fluids, I'm inferring what's happening down below. So I want to take you to one place on the seafloor, which is actually where I started my graduate work in 1998. And that is Axial Seamount, which is located about 300 miles off the shore of Oregon um, along the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And this is kind of the closest underwater volcano to the continental United States. And this is shown here in a blow up where again, we have two plates spreading apart. And the Juan de Fuca plate is the one that is subducting underneath the United States and is a reason we have this string of volcanoes from Washington down to Northern California. And so axial seamount is located right on that spreading axis. And if we zoom in a step further, you can see the sort of the outline of this volcanic caldera over here, um, where there is a lot of active uh, venting of these fluids. And in fact, this is a very active volcano and it's erupted a number of times in the last um, 20 years. And I'll show you a video of that in just a few minutes. So at Axial, as well as other systems I study around the globe, there's some very basic questions I'm interested in. And I've listed a bunch of them here, although I'm really only going to talk about the first two over the uh, next two parts of this talk. So because this is such exploratory research, in the beginning we're asking questions like, who is there? What microbes are present? How does the community change over time? More recently, we've been moving into what do they do and how do they cycle important nutrients like carbon, nitrogen, iron, and sulfur. But there's a whole slew of other questions that my research addresses. Um, is there a microbial loop? That's one of the things I introduced in part one. Are there viruses and grazers? How deep does this habitat go beneath the seafloor? What's its global distribution? How are these microbes contributing to carbon fixation? in the deep ocean, and really how connected are these different habitats, both beneath the seafloor and in the ocean. And when we think really big picture about Earth history, you know, what can we learn about Earth's past and future from the deep ocean? So today I'm really gonna talk here in part two about the first question, and I want to uh, tell a little story about how my research has evolved as DNA sequencing has evolved as well in answering what seems like a really simple question of who is there. So when I started my graduate career, um, environmental microbiology had discovered cloning and sequencing. And we were using this method to help identify the microbes in an environment without having to culture them in the laboratory. Only about 1 to 2% of microbes on our planet have actually been grown in somebody's lab. And so the way that we were very commonly going out into the environment to study these organisms was by extracting their DNA, carrying out a polymerase chain reaction 
really targeting a specific region of the ribosomal RNA gene that's a great phylogenetic marker for these organisms. So basically telling us who they are and who they're related to. And then taking those PCR products and going through a cloning and sequencing exercise, which is now, of course, very, very common in molecular biology, um, but was pretty revolutionary for marine microbiology. What happened um, shortly after I finished my PhD, however, is that DNA sequencing changed, and these next-generation approaches were developed. And during my postdoc, the first of these new sequencers came out. And so I was able to apply some of those techniques to ask this question of who is there in a very different way. So this next generation sequencing approach has really reduced the cost and increased the returns um, for sequencing across every field, but particularly um, in marine microbiology. And during my postdoc um, at the Marine Biological Lab, we helped develop the application of using these types of sequencers to profile microbial communities. And so now we do the same PCR steps, but instead of the laborious and kind of slow cloning and sequencing, we go straight into one of these sequencers um, instead of having to do those cloning steps. So the machine that we developed this approach on the first time was called the 454, and there's now many others, including Illumina and others. So how did that change my view of who is there at Axial Seamount? Well, what it did is it greatly expanded the diversity of life that I was able to detect in this environment. Um, this was actually originally part of the Census of Marine Life that was carried out by the Sloan Foundation. And we were, went to a lot of different habitats in the ocean to try to describe the diversity of microbes present. And this is just one example of two different vents at Axial Seamount where all the different colors represent different microbes that we were able to detect. And just to emphasize how much this changed, uh, what I knew about Axial, I'm putting up here a figure from a paper I published um, in 2003 uh, during my PhD, where I was able to sequence, you can see these numbers for these clones, you know, upwards of like 150 clones from some of these venting fluids. And shown on the x-axis is the number of clones, and on the y is the estimated number of phylotypes or different types of microbes in this environment. And you can see the slope of this line is incredibly steep. There's a lot more diversity out there that we weren't able to capture with this method. And there's maybe 10 or 15 different colors shown below. Well, in 2007, after developing this approach, the numbers have changed a lot. So again, here's two different vents at Axial Seamount. You can see there are many, many more colors. And it's really the numbers on the axes that are important here. So on the X, we are going up to 750,000 sequences that we are able to collect. And on the Y are estimates of how many different microbes are present. Interestingly, though, this line still isn't flattening out, which again emphasizes how much diversity um, within microbes we have on our planet. So the ability to apply these types of new methods to my own research really expanded my own view of the types of microbes living in this environment. And the big question when I saw this data was, why are there so many different microbes and what are they all doing in the environment? And so that's really where my research began to move um, in trying to understand the functional significance of all of that diversity. So when I'm talking about function in these types of systems, it's really how are they gaining energy um, and how are they cycling different nutrients and contributing to different uh, geochemical cycles in the ocean. And so today I'm mostly going to be talking about the bottom part of this pretty complicated drawing. Um, just to take a step back, what I'm showing here are things like hydrogen, CO2, and methane. And at the bottom here, these are all the primary producers in this ecosystem. We talked about those autotrophs in part one that form the base of the microbial food web. And these organisms can use things like iron, sulfur, hydrogen, and nitrogen to generate energy. I've also drawn in here some of these viruses or phage, which I mentioned in part one as well, to indicate that we know they're there, but we're not sure what they're doing. But I think it's important to keep in mind. And then this carbon, of course, gets moved up to the secondary consumers, the heterotrophic bacteria. And of course, this is all connected. So what I really want to know about these microbes at Axial and the questions I'm going to be addressing here are, who are the active subseafloor autotrophs at Axial? How do they gain energy? And how does their activity vary over space, time, and geochemical gradients?
So to answer these questions, I'm going to talk about two different approaches. The first here in part two is shotgun sequencing using both metagenomics and metatranscriptomics, which I'll describe more in the next couple slides. And in part three of the talk, I'll be focusing on stable isotopes experiments that we've done that kind of combine the power of DNA sequencing with um, stable isotopes. And we're going to be using three model systems. Um, and in this case, there are three different vents at axial seamount where I had a large amount of historical data so I could ask these questions in a fairly focused way um, rather than a more exploratory way as I did for the first part of my career. And so the three vents, you're going to hear these names a lot, are anemone, uh, marker 33, and marker 113. So these three vents are located in different parts of axial seamount. This is the same image I showed earlier showing the caldera. Uh, and they're only a, at most a two kilometers apart, this distance across the volcano. But we chose them because, we, again, we had historical data, and we had also characterized them geochemically. So if we really want to figure out what microbes are doing in the environment, we also need to know what energy sources are available to them. So what's shown here are those three vents and a variety of different features, uh, environmental characteristics, ranging from temperature, pH, and a number of um, nutrients and things that you know, microbes really like to eat. So you can see these fluids range all um, in the mid-20 degrees Celsius. They have slightly acidic pHs. And I've highlighted here uh, three things that I really wanted you to pay attention to. So the first in blue is nitrate. Um, and the anemone vent has a lot of nitrate in it. And if you draw your eye down in green, it also has the most oxygen. So this vent in particular is rich in electron acceptors. Um, and if you go to the other end of that nitrate column and look at marker 113, um, the nitrate is much lower. And if you pop down there again to oxygen, you can see the oxygen is also lower. So we're going from a more um, oxidizing to a more reducing environment. And the vent in the middle sort of falls in between. And if you look at the hydrogen concentrations, you can see that same trend where we have a lot of hydrogen available at anemone um, and very little at marker 113. So it's important to keep this chemistry in mind as we interpret our microbial data. So one interesting thing that happened while we were conducting this study, which was over a three-year time period, is in the middle of our last two uh, sampling periods, Axial erupted again. And so the video you're seeing now is seafloor footage taken by the ROV Ropos by the University of Washington, showing um, what the volcano looked like shortly after one of these deep sea eruptions. And this is new lava has been erupted onto the seafloor. And all this white stuff that we see is mainly composed of microbes and sulfur. And when these eruptions occur, this is that material being sucked into a sampling container on the remotely operated vehicle. When these eruptions occur, you get a huge influx of heat and energy into the environment. And there's a bunch of microbes that take advantage of that hydrogen sulfide in particular. And they oxidize it, and it creates sort of these what looks like snow. Um, and we call these snowblower events, in fact. Um, and so you can think about this sort of like a deep sea phytoplankton bloom, except instead of phytoplankton, it's these very deeply buried microbial communities. But this happened in the middle of our sampling period, which began in 2013. We sampled again in 2014. And then in early 2015, before our sampling season, Axial erupted again. So once we get material like this, like new fluids coming out of the seafloor back into the lab, we carried out a number of DNA and RNA sequencing approaches that I just want to review um, exactly what it was that we did. So we extracted DNA. And instead of doing a PCR this time, we just sequenced it all. Um, and this is called metagenomics. So if we were doing this from an individual, we would extract DNA from their blood and then stick it all back together. However, we have a mixed microbial community. We have everything that's in that sample. So it's actually really hard to stick it all back together again. But what can we do with that type of data? Well, basically, what we're doing is we're accessing the genomes of these microbes that we don't have in culture. So we're identifying who the key players are. We're looking at their functional potential, their metabolism. And we can also look at some really neat things, like how genes are moving around and some of the evolutionary dynamics. So what did we find when we did the sequencing of metagenomes from Axial? 
I'm going to be showing a number of plots like this, which I recognize are a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but basically, we have the three events and the three years over here. And the different colors represent, in this example, the different types of microbes we found. That first column is background seawater, um, as well as a plume above the volcano after that large eruption. And what I hope you can see uh, is that the microbes that you find in background seawater, all the way over here, are still found in many of these vent fluids. However, there's also a lot of organisms, such as these epsilon proteobacteria, or this yellow group in the archaea over here, that are not found in background seawater. So these microbes are coming out of the vent fluid, mixing with background seawater, and that's what we're collecting. Hopefully what you can also see is not all the vents look the same from this perspective. So there's a lot of blue in the marker 33 vents and a lot of orange in the marker 113 vents. And I'll talk a little bit about what those differences are and who those microbes are carrying it out. But this tells us that the vents have different key players and they're distinct from background seawater. We can then start digging in to the who and getting to what. So what are they doing? So what I'm showing here, again, on the upper part of this diagram are still the same thing, the three different years, the three different vents. But now these colors represent different um, metabolisms focused on oxygen, nitrogen, methane, hydrogen, and sulfur. And so here we're looking for known genes that are key to carrying out metabolisms related to those five compounds. And that's what's listed here, the gene name down the y-axis. Now, what's important to note here is that almost every sample has at least a little bit of color for almost every um, different gene. And this shows that there's kind of widespread shared gene potential among these different sites. There are some exceptions, which I've highlighted here in yellow. These genes are all related to making methane through a process called methanogenesis, which is carried out within the domain archaea. And you can see that there's a lot of methanogenesis genes over here at marker 113 and far less in the other samples. So this is giving us some indication that maybe there are some different metabolisms going on, although there is a lot of shared potential. So the next thing we did with these samples is instead of extracting DNA, we, sample, uh, we extracted RNA. And RNA allows you to access the gene expression patterns of these uncultured microbes. The methods are very similar, although they're certainly more challenging, but basically extract RNA, make cDNA, and then directly sequence it again. We don't always try to stick it all back together. Um, we're often using our genomes to then map all those transcripts back. But with this tool, you can identify who are the active microbial players by seeing their transcripts and what is actually happening when you first capture that sample on the seafloor. And in our case, when we filter the sample on the seafloor, we immediately fix it so that all the message RNA stops. So the cells just stop you know, metabolizing. And so we really are capturing what's happening at the point of sampling. And then we can start looking into these gene expression and metabolic pathways. So now what you're looking at is a very similar diagram to what I showed you with the DNA sequences, but instead what we're looking at are the transcripts of these different key metabolisms. So again, the vents on the top, the different col colors representing oxygen, nitrogen, methane, hydrogen, and sulfur. And what I hope you can see is that there are fewer dots on this plot, meaning that a lot of the genes that we detected in the DNA pool are actually not turned down at the point of sampling. And just one example, again, going back to those methanogenic pathways, uh, we see a lot fewer of the vents are actually carrying out, the organisms at the vents are carrying out methanogenesis, and overall we see less shared transcription across these different sites. There's another way of looking at this data which isn't quite so biased, right? I'm only looking at genes I already know exist in this particular example, but we can also take all of the genes and calculate how different the vents are from one another. And that's what I'm showing over here with a correlation distance here on the x-axis with each vent. Um, and you, what you can see is that the vents are overall similar to one another, so they're more closely related by year to the vent that they came from than they are to a different one. But also, this correlation distance at the bottom is very small. So overall, the organisms in these vents and their genes are very similar. 
However, when we look at the metatranscriptomes, again, where we're looking at these gene expression patterns, we can see large differences. Again, down here on the x-axis, looking at that correlation distance. However, the vents are still mostly grouping by which vent we sampled. So marker 113 vents are distinct from marker 33 and down to an enemy. So these functional profiling techniques allow us to get a handle on what the potential is of these microbial communities versus what they're actually doing when we sample them on the seafloor. Another really neat thing that you can do with this type of DNA sequencing data is try to look at the microbial populations. So not just these marker genes, but also try to capture the entire genome to figure out um, how these different organisms uh, are related to one another and what they're doing in the environment. And the way we do this is we take all of the sequencing data and we stick it back together, but we try to stick it back into uh, individual microbes. And so in this way, we're calling it a potential microbial genome because in fact, you could have strain variation that computationally you cannot um, detect. And then what we have is a bin of sequences that we believe all belong to a very specific population of microbes. We can identify it and then take our RNA data to figure out which ones of those potential genomes are actually um, active in the environment. So this is two, these are two examples where we really focused in on genome bins from some of these high temperature microbial populations that I mentioned. Uh, so the first example I'm showing, this is a group of these bins from Axial that all belong to a group of bacteria called the aquificales. These are organisms that can carry out the oxidation of hydrogen and both sulfur and nitrate reduction. And what you can see, this is a heat map of how abundant they were at different vents, is that these anemone vents had a lot of expression of these different populations of aquificales, and then a very different group was present at marker 33 and almost none of them at marker 113. So again, even though we had these very broad functional similarities, when we dig down to that population level, it's in fact very different groups and populations that are active um, in the system. And this is another example. You've heard me talk quite a bit about these methanogens. These are archaea. And this example belonging to both methanococcus and methanothermococcus. And these are organisms that are important primary producers also. They basically use hydrogen and CO2 to make methane. And similar to what we saw in our, uh, in our transcripts, we see that these genes are really turned on big time in these organisms at marker 113 and to a lesser extent at marker 33 and not at all at the anemone vent. So we have very vent specific sub seafloor populations that are active, they're living beneath the seafloor and they're carrying out different functions um, based on these types of measurements. So interestingly, even though we're in this one place on the seafloor, it's just a few kilometers wide, we see that even just within axial seamount, all, all the vents are not hosting the same populations, especially when we get beneath the seafloor into these warmer anoxic zones, which I introduced at the beginning of my talk. So we certainly, as I showed, have a large seawater influence on this system with seawater cycling through and bringing a lot of common microbes into all of the vents that we're sampling. However, when we get deeper, we see some of these vent endemic epsilon proteobacteria as well as these high temperature populations that I just referred to. So these organisms are not present everywhere and something is making it so each vent develops its own population. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in part three. So just to wrap up this section, I wanted to thank the uh, funding agencies for this work with track from 1998 when I started my PhD to present day where I've been funded mostly by NSF and the Moore Foundation, and of course, a great group of people that made this work possible. Thank you.